everyone welcome 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 today's actually very excited we i've just been told uh we have over 600 registrants for today's info session so we're actually it's a, i i honestly wish i could see some of you I, i'm only seeing my colleagues who are wonderful but i know that you're all there um so we are going to go ahead and get going again welcome uh to the cultural sector recovery grants for organizations info session um do note that closed captioning is available by clicking the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom window. However, before we really get into the swing of things, we have a lovely guest. I'd like to introduce you to the Executive Director of the Mass Cultural Council, Michael Bobbitt, who would like to share a few words. Michael? Hey, friends. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's wonderful to be with such a large group of creative people on this morning where it seems the latest heat wave in Massachusetts has finally ended. Uh, but I wanted to thank you all first for making the world a better place, especially during the last couple of years. Um, as Greg mentioned, my name is Michael Bobbitt and I'm the executive director of Mass Cultural Council. I'm very glad that you are here. Uh, Mass Cultural Council is your state agency working to support and promote the power of culture across Massachusetts. You're here this morning to learn about cultural sector recovery grants for organizations. We are grateful for the state's investment of federal ARPA and state surplus dollars, and we have a historic level of pub public funding to distribute. Please take a moment to send your state legislators a note of thanks. If you don't know who they are, uh, we'll get you that information, um, but get to know them, add them to your VIP list and build relationships with them on an annual basis. This will go a long way in con continuing to receive their support for the cultural sector. Uh, when we received our allocation earlier this year, our first step was to ask you what you needed and you told us loud and clear, unrestricted aid to support your ongoing recovery. And we have developed a program that provides that for you. Um, as we continue to move through and beyond this pandemic, uh, your work is more important than ever. These grants are meant to not only support you as you continue to recover and rebuild, but to help you look forward and chart a new path for growth. Our incredible team who is so committed to you has created a simple application. The pandemic was hard enough, so applying for grants should be easy, right? In fact, I just heard this morning that someone applied and they got the grant application done in 44 minutes. It's really exciting. Uh, I want to assure you no grant writing experience is necessary. Our team is here to support you, especially if you've never applied or received Mass Cultural Council funding before. We do want to hear from you, and we are excited to see what you will do with this funding. Please help us by sharing this information with other, other, other organizations, especially organizations that have been historically marginalized, BIPOC, Native American, Deaf, Disabled, Rural, and others. The success of these organizations grows the whole cultural sector. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Greg, who will walk you through, and you'll need to uh, walk you through everything you'll need to know about the program. I wish you the best as you move through the application process. And as a reminder, a second recovery program for artists, creatives, cultural bearers, and gig workers will open its application next week. Uh, Greg, turning it back to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, yeah, that was that, that. Thank you again. There, there's so much that we're actually going to highlight a little bit uh, further as we kind of get into it. So for today, your upfront presenters are going to be Amy, Sarah and myself. However, behind the scenes, we have the awesome Cheyenne and Lillian who are going to be doing some amazing logistical uh, support in the end. They will also help get your questions answered throughout today's webinar. So speaking of questions, let's lay down a few ground rules to start. Uh, we will answer questions via Zoom's Q&A feature throughout the webinar. To access it, uh, simply click on the link at the bottom of your screen. As I mentioned, Lillian and Cheyenne will help us pause intermittently uh, throughout the webinar to get your questions answered. Do note that Zoom's chat feature is disabled for audience use. Uh, however, we will use it, again, intermittently to help share helpful links um, uh, with you all uh, within that feature. After concluding our webinar, uh, this is a recorded session, by the way, um, we are going to go ahead and process the recording and post it onto our YouTube page. So folks who were unable to attend can, can go ahead and um, view it. We will also take note of all the questions that are going to be asked during today's info session and tomorrow's. 
and use those questions to help update our FAQ uh, page. Lastly, I do want to note that there are, as I mentioned, over 600 of you and uh, about what five or six of us. So in the event that we are unable to answer all of your questions, which is highly likely, we do have other communication channels set up to remain connected with you all between now and, and essentially uh, the deadline, which I'll go over in greater detail um, at the end. Uh, do note, if you do have any questions that you'd like to ask now, if it's something that's very nuanced, complex, or specific that may not be relevant to other applicants, I think it might just be best to, to reach out to us online with a question of that nature. If it's something that's a little bit more general that might apply to other folks, feel free to ask now. We'll, we'll do our best to get that situated. Uh, lastly, I do want to take note that it's 11 a.m., and I know many of us are probably on our second or third cup of caffeine, myself included, so I ask kindly that you all evoke your inner Shaw day smooth operations we're just everything's going to be nice and chill whether it's sage or meditation whatever the case is we're going to just have a nice time as we get through this so that said let's uh let's get on with it so for today's agenda i will be uh initially talking about the programmatic overview and then i'll pass it over to my colleague sarah who will uh, discuss the eligibility and grant determinations honestly that's where a lot of your questions will be um, and finally, Amy will conclude by talking about the grant management database um, and the timeline questions as well. And then we'll open up uh, to Q&As at that point. Now, in a nutshell, these are unrestricted grants ranging from $5,000 to $75,000 to Massachusetts cultural organizations and businesses that have been negatively impacted uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. So the key word here is unrestricted. So Although there are many uses uh, for how these grants uh, can be applied, typically uh, what we're gonna go ahead and see is that they'll be used to cover costs associated with staffing, occupancy, programmatic expenses, and also uh, technological and infrastructural upgrades um, as well. Do note, for those of you that are familiar with grant programs, uh, one key stipulation here is that these funds cannot be used to cover fund that another financial aid source is covering as well. And with that, I will pass it on to Sarah to cover eligibility. Sarah. Terrific. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. And as Greg said, I'm going to talk about eligibility, and then I'm going to talk about the, um, the prioritization points and how we're going to be calculating grant amounts. So if you have questions about eligibility, I'm going to pause at the end of this so that um, my colleagues can read off any questions that have come into us from the chat. If you could keep your questions related to eligibility for right now, that will really help them in focusing this. So eligibility is it's a two-part thing. And here's the first part. Your primary mission or purpose is creating and or presenting cultural activities or services to the cultural sector in the arts, humanities, and interpretive sciences. And we're going to determine that by looking at your mission statement, but we're also going to look at your programming. So if your mission statement maybe isn't as clear as this, we are going to take a look at your organization to understand that. Um, and we definitely want you to be um, eligible. So next slide, please. Like I said, it's a two-part thing. The first part is that your activities and your mission have to be fully cultural, by which we mean, again, primarily active in the arts, humanities, or interpretive sciences. The second eligibility is that you need to be one of these kinds of organizations. I'm gonna go through each one of them individually. So next slide. So first of all, eligibility um, applies to organizations that are federally or state recognized tribes or urban Indian organizations with ties to the land that is currently known as Massachusetts. These organizations know who they are. Those organizations will be eligible to apply. Our next slide, please. Fiscally sponsored organizations. So if you have an organization that is unincorporated, but has a nonprofit objective, or if you're incorporated and in the process of getting your federal tax exempt status, you can apply as long as you have a fiscal sponsor. You do have to have a Massachusetts address. That's you, your organization, not your fiscal sponsor. And the majority of your programming has to happen in Massachusetts. So if you are Rhode Island based, but you do a lot of Massachusetts work, this is not going to be you. Um, go on to the next slide, please. 
for-profit corporations, cooperatives, partnerships, or limited liability companies. So these are for-profit businesses that are owned by individuals. So therefore, we're, we're talking about um, for-profits that are not publicly traded on the stock exchange, that are not subsidiaries of other corporations. The organization has to have a Massachusetts or a, a Massachusetts address on your businesses, federal businesses, or partnership tax return. And we are looking at organizations that have three or fewer locations. So this is not for large chain organizations. This is for independent for profits in Massachusetts. And the next slide, please. Municipal organizations. So many of our municipalities have programs that have a dedicated function that again is in the arts, humanities, or interpretive sciences. And those organizations that do their own programming are eligible to apply. This includes local cultural councils that do their own programming, cultural districts, historical commissions, um, public art commissions, municipally owned um, performing arts venues that present cultural activity in the community, those are all eligible to apply. And next slide. And nonprofits. So Massachusetts recognized nonprofit organizations. This includes organizations that were established in other states but have registered as foreign corporations in Massachusetts. And your federal tax exempt status does need to currently be active. So Again, you can you can check all of that um, online. You can check your federal tax status through the IRS. You can make sure that all of that's up to date. But those are the kinds of organizations that we fund. Next slide, please. So there is an exception to the for-profits. If your for-profit is either a sole proprietorship or a single member LLC, then you're eligible to apply to our individual's grant program, not the organization's. The distinguishing factor here is if your business proceeds are being run through a Schedule C on your personal tax return, you're going to be treated as an individual for the purpose of this program. If you are a multi-member LLC and you are filing either a 1065 or an 1120 tax form, those organizations will be treated as businesses for the purpose of this program. Also, K-12 schools and degree-granting institutions or programs with a parent organization are not eligible. So a theater program at a college is not eligible. An art museum at a college is not eligible. Um, if the parent organization is eligible, they should be applying rather than a program that has a parent organization. So. I'm going to pause for a second and see if we have questions in the um, Q&A that I can help answer right now. And Hi, Sarah. This yeah. is Cheyenne. Mm -hmm. um, this question I'm going to ask because it's very specifically worded. Can right. the organization be DBA, doing business as, through an existing LLC? Well, a, a DBA is simply a matter of using a different name for an existing organization. That's a doing business as. So it's the status of the underlying legal entity that we are looking at. So that, I hope, helps. Um, yeah, so I, I'm hearing you say that the, the status of the organization that's using a DBA is the yes. one that you should be looking at. Exactly. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. I also saw a question fly by about uh, organizations that have been started more recently. Your organization that was started after the pandemic began is eligible to apply. Um, the organization does have to have been created and have activity prior to June 30th of 2022. So if you start um, a new business tomorrow, that's not going to be eligible to apply. I also see a question about physical addresses. Mass Cultural Council as a state agency needs to have a physical address for every organization. 
you also can provide a mailing address and we know that for a lot of folks that's a much more convenient thing to use hello sarah and this is lillian i, I also uh -huh. have another question here is a parent organization the same as an umbrella organization or a sister organization I think I'd want a little more detail to understand exactly what the applicant is asking. But when we talk about a parent organization, we are talking about a program of a larger organization. So for example, there are social service organizations that have a specific program that uses arts and culture for their social service goals. We are looking at the status of the organization that has the legal status. So that's the, in this case, the parent organization would be that social service organization. And if its primary purpose is not arts, humanities, and interpretive sciences, they're not going to be eligible. Um, I, the question about sister organizations, I think I'd need to maybe have a direct conversation with that person to clarify what, what their concern is. Anything else? If not, I'll move on to um, our questions about how to uh, how to apply and how our grants are going to be determined. Okay, so move on, not to the next slide, but to, yeah, move on to the next slide. So if you're eligible, please apply. And truly our, our goal here is that every eligible organization is going to be funded. So if you are eligible, absolutely submit an application. I also just wanna call out that a lot of the images that we have used on our slides throughout this presentation are works that have been submitted to our artists fellowship programs. So we thank the artists for their wonderful work and uh, we're glad that we were able to give them a little more prominence here today. Our next slide, please. So as Greg mentioned, the grant amounts for organizations are going to range from $5,000 to $75,000. And I wish I could tell you exactly how much your grant is going to be, but one of the issues that will influence this is how many applications we get and the information that we get from those applicants. So all part of what's going to go into the formula is the number of applicants, the pre-pandemic operating expenses of those applicants. And obviously, if your organization started after the pandemic began, we're going to have to use other information for that. We'll, we'll leave that out. And then we have prioritization categories. And these are all on our, our guidelines on the website. If you can go to the next slide, please. So what I really, really want to emphasize here that these are not eligibility criteria. You might be an organization that does not meet any of these categories and you will still be eligible to get a grant. And we really encourage you to apply. But we are giving a leg up to organizations that are new or previously unfunded applicants. So these are folks who either haven't applied to us before or have been unsuccessful. We're really trying to make sure that the resources get spread around. We are, um, funding priorities include historically under-resourced communities. And this is uh, two broad definitions. First of all, BIPOC-centered organizations. And if you are BIPOC-centered organizations, our definition on that is an organization where the primary mission or practice is centered on BIPOC artists and art um, or you know, cultural activities, but also that the organization is led by BIPOC individuals. Um, on our website, it, when you log in as an organization on the Smart Simple application platform, the first thing you're going to see is current opportunities. And the BIPOC-centered self-identification questionnaire is there. Um, if you are a BIPOC organization, you should absolutely complete that questionnaire. And there's no additional activity necessary after that. You do need to complete it by September 28th, which is the application deadline for this program. The other broad category is under-resourced cities and towns. Um, many of you might be familiar with the concept of the gateway cities. That's a definition that applies both household income and educational attainments to a particular size of city. Our, our under-resourced cities and towns are 
all communities, no matter what their size of population, we've applied those same characteristics. We've identified them. There is a list of those cities and towns on our website. You can see that. Just go to the website and search for under-resourced and you will find that list. Um, one, as, as Michael said, this whole program um, started through the legislature's allocation of the funds and some of their directives. Um, so we are making sure that economic need is considered, job creation is considered, and tourism impact. These are all elements of the application. For the most part, these are checkoff boxes or work that we are going to be doing on calculations. So I just want to flag economic need. I've definitely talked to some folks who are saying, we're actually showing surpluses for the last couple of years. But they're showing surpluses either because they've gotten lots of additional support, PPP funds, shuttered venue funds, other grant programs specifically um, from the federal or state government to address COVID need. And without those funds, those organizations would be in deep deficit and in trouble. Or we have organizations that have shown a surplus, but it's, it's because they have constricted their activities to such a degree they have made a real effort to live within much more limited means. But that constriction is also an indication of economic need. So it's not as easy as, oh, look, I've got a surplus. I must not be getting the priority points for that. So please don't let that stop you from applying. Finally, we are looking at organizations that have received little or no other state or federal COVID relief aid. Um, those are organizations that because they haven't been in line for those resources, we want to make sure that um, we have prioritized them in our process. Our next slide. Once again, if you're eligible, please apply. We are really encouraging that you um, submit an application. Again, September 28th, 11.59 p.m. Get your application in. I'm going to pause again uh, for any other questions that might relate to, to this portion of our presentation today. Anything else from Cheyenne or Lillian? Um, yes, I am going to just read a question um, that may not be as um, pertinent right now. Should mm -hmm. sole proprietor LLCs stay on this call or wait for a different presentation for individuals? You're not going to be eligible for this grant program, so we will not take it personally if you leave us now. Um, the Individuals Grant Program has two webinars coming up, one of them on the 23rd of August, the other one on October 6th. And the, I'll just ask another, because I think a lot of people are having a question about umbrellas versus individual applications. This one is, can two arts organizations that are working on a collaborative project apply together? Would there be any benefit to this? Um, this is a program that supports individual organizations. It's not about project support, so you're not even going to be telling us about your project. If both organizations are eligible, then both organizations should apply individually. And if only one organization should apply, then that single organization should apply. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you for being here today. We are really excited about this program and our opportunity to support the sector. So I'm going to kick it to my colleague, Amy, who is going to talk to you about the process of actually applying for this program. And at the end of the session, we will come back and answer more questions. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Amy, and I'll be talking about the application process and the timeline today. So you will be applying um, for your organization for COVID relief funding through our online grants management system called Smart Simple. Um, if you've applied for a Mass Cultural Council grant before, you can log in with the email that you have used previously, 
This is the email attached to your organization and the organization's applications for grants from Mass Cultural Council. If you are new, um, welcome. <laughs> and um, so if this is your first time applying to anything from us, please go ahead and make a new account. And technical troubleshooting questions can go to this email below, grants underscore help underscore desk at art.state.ma.us. Next slide, please. So as discussed earlier, there are prioritization categories for how grants will be administered. So it is essential that you update your user profile with the information that helps us determine this. So even if you have an existing um, account with us, you wanna make sure that you update your information. Updating your profile is not optional, but you may, you may choose whether or not to complete the BIPOC-centered organization self-identification form. Next slide, please. So while you're completing your application online, you'll want to have your tax documents from the last three fiscal years with you. You can take a second to see which forms you'll need depending on what type of organization you are. Um, note that for fiscally sponsored organizations, programs of municipalities, tribal governments, and nonprofits that file a 990N, you will provide a statement of income or expenses and a balance sheet instead. So we can take a second to look. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we understand that some organizations were created after fiscal year 19. So if so, uh, please provide the tax form or statement of income and expenses for the years that you do have and just put down zero for the years that you don't. Uh, if you have filled out the tax information to the very best of your ability and are still worried that you're missing documentation during the submission process, uh, don't worry, we'll follow up with you to make sure that your application is complete. Next slide, please. So applications are already open. Um, if you require accommodations such as translation, interpretation, or alternate formats, please submit a request at least two weeks before the deadline. Uh, there's information in the chat about where to submit that request specifically. Uh, as Sarah said earlier, the deadline is September 28, 2022 at 1159 p.m. Eastern time. This deadline is not flexible. Um, our grants management system will close at that time, so you want to make sure that you get it in beforehand. You'll be notified of your funding status in late January of 2023, and contracts will be sent out electronically in February of 2023. So for reporting and advocacy reasons, uh, grantees will have to submit a sweet, simple, very straightforward final report by July 14th of next year. And yeah, thanks, Greg. I'll throw it back to you for the last slide. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, just doing a quick time check. See, it's uh, 1130s. Yes, perfect. So we are good on time. So as I mentioned uh, previously, uh, again, I see already we have 75 questions in the Q&A. We will definitely not be able to answer these um, today, but we do have other channels set up to remain connected with you all between today um, and the deadline. So the first of which is if uh, once you actually uh, view our agency dates page, you'll notice that we have already scheduled a few office hours. Those are essentially uh, small group meetings where program staff will be there for the entire hour. It kind of flows and structures like a, basically like a, like a drop-in. So essentially people kind of come in once they get the information they need, they leave. If it's helpful for stay to stay, you know, throughout the entirety of that particular session, feel free. It's a great way, personally, it's a great way to also put a face to a name, get to know you as individuals a little bit more, more importantly, uh, I don't want to say more importantly, but also your organizations um, as well. If Again, if you have very kind of complex or specific situations and you prefer one-on-one -on -one assistance, uh, the next bullet point is a link to our Calendly account where you could actually go ahead and schedule a 30-minute uh, session with program staff um, that we're going to go ahead and do uh, through Zoom. Uh, next up, some of you, we've already been fielding many emails, so we have a specific email address um, dedicated to this grant program. It's right over here, organization.recovery at art.state.ma.us. Uh, next and lastly, we actually, we also have a hotline set up as well. Uh, one thing to note there though, is that it literally is only one phone line. So if we are on the phone helping an applicant and someone else calls, you will be redirected to the voicemail. I encourage you to still leave a voicemail because once you do, your voicemail recording will be sent to our organization uh, recovery email address. So we'll, all the entire team will be able to hear your recording and whoever's scheduled to be on the phone that day will be able to follow up with you um, afterward. Um, 
if you are a new applicant and you are having trouble and you don't have an account and in the process of creating an account as amy described if you're having difficulties doing that again uh the grants help desk is is the uh, email address to reach out to to help get your account situated now once you get past that point or if you already have an account if you have any particular questions about the application about your profile whatever the case is uh, there is actually a built-in notes feature that if you send, uh, if you use that feature, it'll basically, um, it's essentially, it's the equivalent of sending an, an email through the actual database. So once you input a note there, it'll send um, that note to our email address. Um, and we, again, all the entire staff is responding to those emails. So we'll be able to follow up with you like that. That's actually very helpful because if we get a communication through the notes feature, it's already linked to your application, to your organization, to your account. So we have all the information we need to be able to address your concerns and to, excuse me, to actually help you. Um, if you are a new organization, I strongly encourage you to sign up to our newsletter, to our social media platforms, to our Power of Culture blog. We have many exciting additional grant programs uh, that are coming out as early as, as, as this fall. This is really the beginning to building bridges with, with all of you, especially, especially and particularly those of you who we don't have a relationship uh, with. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, I will, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm just circling my brain to see if there's any other things I want to go ahead and elaborate on with this slide, but I think we've pretty much covered it. I will open the floor now to Cheyenne and Lillian to see if there are any other questions we can ask. Hello, yes, this is Lillian. One um, question we've had from quite a few people is, if my organization has received a local cultural council grant, are we considered new or unfunded? Or do we not meet that prioritization category? This is Sarah. We are not looking at local cultural council grants for that. We are looking specifically at grants that come from the state agency directly. And one other question, we've had quite a few questions about the origin of this funding is this the you know ARPA funding from the house bill earlier in the year can you talk a little bit more about where this money comes from absolutely um and, and that's exactly where it comes from this is a combination of the funds that came to the commonwealth from the american rescue plan act plus some other funds that the commonwealth um, dedicated to this particular funding there is one very large piece of legislation that um, allocates funding to a lot of different agencies and a lot of different sectors. This is the piece of funding that came to Mass Cultural Council to distribute. And total of about 50, $51 million that will be spread, not spread across this program and the individual support program. And the application, I believe that there is um, a PDF of the application available on our website now on the application guidelines page. So you can take a look at the questions before you open up the application in the Smart Simple platform. Um, but it's, you, you'll be surprised at how few questions there really are. We have also had a number of questions similar to this one. Our organization's mailing address is not in an under-resourced city or town, but the programming we do is done in an under-resourced city or town. Does that fit the priority consideration? At this point, we are looking at the legal address of the organization. So it's the location of that physical address that you use, not the location of the programming. That that's something we're considering it's something we're going to be exploring but it is not something that we are doing for the purpose of this grant application hey this is cheyenne <laughs> we have on a question uh i saw on the application a question about tourism greater than 50 mile visitors curious if organizations that support tourism bolsters the application or if the funding is more prioritized for organizations that serve local residents? This is, again, I, I mentioned this is actually part of the legislation from the Commonwealth that allocated the funds, and they have established this as one of the priorities. 
the impact on tourism, the impact on job creation, and the existence of economic need are all things that are called out in the legislation. So the priority is going, to, there will be some small prioritization for the organizations that have a positive impact on tourism. Thank you, Sarah. And while we're on the mandates from the legislation, can you give us a, a rundown on negatively impacted by COVID-19? The question is, is there a clear definition? The, the definition is around the economics, and that's why we are asking for your um, income and expenses. For most of you, that's going to be represented by your tax returns, looking at fiscal 19, pre-pandemic, fiscal 20, partially pandemic, and fiscal 21, entirely pandemic impacted. So we're going to be taking the information from those forms and, and running some calculations based on that information. And Sarah, this is Lillian. We've had quite a few questions about asking how the grant amounts will be determined. Can you just talk a little bit about the process we have in place and, and the factors that go into that? Sure. So those are all the prioritization categories that we mentioned. There's going to be a mathematical formula that will take those into account, um, but it will also be influenced by the budget size or the, the expense size of the organization and it will be influenced by how many applications we get. I can tell you, we, we have established a minimum grant of $5,000. So as long as you submit an eligible application, you meet the eligibility criteria, you're, you're in the pool. But until we know how many applications we've got, we really can't give much, we can't really give an indication of how much the grant amount will be. Sarah, this is Cheyenne. Did you mention up to how much money total will be awarded? It's about 35 to $36 million for the organization support program and another $15 million for uh, the individual support. And in addition, there were um, grants awarded through our cultural facilities application. And those organizations that received funds that were identified as being from this particular financial resource have been notified that that's where that, that grant came from. Thank you so much. Um, if there aren't other questions, in, Sarah, I actually um, do have another question. Um, a couple have come in about, is there any incentive for getting the application completed and in sooner, or when will they be reviewed? That's a great question. The advantage of getting it in sooner is that we can start our review process sooner, but it does not put you in the front of the line for the funding. So um, all of the, you know, as of the 28th, we will start reviewing every new application and you know, following up if we find a problem on something, but all of this has to be done so that we can present um, the funding proposals to our governing council and announcements will be made in January after that happens. I, Sarah, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I think it would be helpful just based on the questions. I won't read one, um, but I think it'd be helpful if you gave us an idea of the questions that are asked in terms of tourism and job creation. Sure. Um, again, we've really worked to make this as simple as possible. So that's that's going to be a checkoff box and. For job creation, we are asking you how many 1099s and W-2s your organization issues. And for the tourism impact, we're using criteria that have been used by other state agencies, which is um, audiences that come from more than 50 miles away or from out of state. 
And we know that some organizations don't track that or it's not relevant to them. That is also an answer that one can give to that question. So it's just checking off the box. And Sarah, we've had a few questions asking if we can give some kind of general examples of what we mean by organizations in the arts, in the humanities, and in the interpretive sciences. Can you go into that just a little bit more specifically? Sure. Well, I mean, first of all, we're looking at what your organization does. And a lot of that's really quite simple. You know, theater companies, music organizations, mm -hmm. art museums, community music schools, community-based art centers, um, interpretive sciences, we're talking about organizations that interpret the natural world for the public. So not scientific research, but things like zoos, aquariums, watershed alliances, botanical gardens, um, environmental education programs. So all of those would be eligible. Humanities, we're talking about organizations that you know, are functioning in the traditional humanities. So history, literature, philosophy, um, historical societies certainly are a lot of those literary magazines, definitely a part of that as well. But we also know that we will come across folks who are doing things that we hadn't thought about, but when we look at their mission and we look at their activities, and if you're not a nonprofit, you probably don't have a mission, but you should just describe generally, you know, what your purpose is. Um, you know, give us that information or, you know, reach out to us through those office hours or through the dedicated email and we will, we will give you guidance. Sarah, I have another question here. Um, can you clarify, does the application ask us to self-identify if we meet the prioritization categories or does MCC determine that on their own? Excellent question again. We are determining that. Um, you'll be giving us all the information we need to determine that by filling out our BIPOC-centered self-identification. We'll have your legal address. We have our own database of grants applied for and awarded. So you know, all of that will be information that feeds into this. Thank you for that response. Um, can you also address, there have been a few questions about if there will be narrative space within the application itself to explain any of the budgeting items or things like that. Yeah, you know, there's a text box for you to tell us about your pandemic expenses. You can include information there, but honestly, we are keeping the calculations on this based as much as possible on the, the economic data that you are giving us. So a narrative where you explain to us the challenges that you've had, you know, it's valuable. We, we know you want to tell us that. We will collect that information, but it's not going to impact the calculations. Sarah, I have a question here. Um, the grants are unrestricted, but what will be asked for in the final report in terms of use of funds and also the connection uh, to COVID recovery? We really do not want the final report to be a barrier or a hurdle for folks. So um, there will probably be a very small section for us, for you to give us anecdotal information that we can use as part of our reporting and our own advocacy. Um, there will be check boxes where you tell us what you did. Um, and where you, what you didn't do. So you'll commit to the fact that you did not duplicate benefits with other funds that have been awarded to you that are restricted. But it's, we are, our intent really is that, that that final report gets us some information we need without it becoming a barrier for you because we know that everybody's time is really limited. 
And we've had a few questions about what cities and towns fall under the under-resourced cities and towns list. So I believe there are 122, and I'm going to link to that in the chat. There is a full list on our website. Great. Um, Sarah, do we have the question, the Form 990 combines capital and operating funding. Capital funds are usually restricted, e.g. restoration infrastructure. How do you account for this in determining, determining economic need? Again, in our goal to make this as simple as possible, we are not separating that from this, this purpose. Okay, and I have two questions here. The first is, if we have not completed our 2021 audited 990 PC, should we use the previous year or should we use our internal 2021 statements? If you have a draft, we'd like to have a draft. Um, if you don't even have a draft yet, then yes, use your internal documents and just so each year gets uploaded separately. You'll upload your fiscal 19, you'll upload your fiscal 20, you'll upload your fiscal 21. You can provide a cover sheet on the fiscal 21 that says we do not have our, our reports, so we're providing our internal documentation. And then just kind of a general question about if you're unsure if your organization has an account in the Smart Simple system, how do you find that out? And if it's been years since you've used that account, do you register a new account or use the existing one? It's a great question. So we we only started using the Smart Simple system last fall, in fact, just about this time last year. So we imported an awful lot of data from an existing uh, program we've been using before that. If you go to create um, a profile, first of all, your, as Amy mentioned, your email address is your unique user ID. And if you put that email address in, you can use the forgot password prompt. If you've never, if that email, let's say the person whose email might have been associated with your organization, that person might have moved on, you just start a new profile using your current email. You need to make sure you register as an organization, not as an individual. And you will get to a section where you either connect your new profile to an organization that's already in our database, in which case you'll discover that it's already there, or you'll have to add it for the first time, in which case there are a few more questions involved in creating that profile. And I did want to address, so we've had a lot of questions about what constitutes other pandemic relief funding. We do have a list of programs in our FAQs, so I'll link to that now. And also on the application, you are asked to check off boxes with, you know, shuttered venues, operators grant, PPP money, idle loans. There's also a section for other if you don't see your specific pandemic relief program there. We've had a questions about expenses. Sarah, can you please elaborate on um, the time frame and which expenses people will be asked to report? Again, it's the applic the this is for the final report, correct? No, I meant in the application, yes. Um, <laughs> we are asking you to give us your 990, pages from your 990. Um, there is a section for you to identify specific pandemic related expenses. You calculate a number and then there's a box for you to describe that. And what we're looking for is to get a sense and, and to use this as part of our calculations. You know, did you have to buy a tent so you could do outdoor programming? Have you had to uh, increase what you've spent on cleaning because of the pandemic? How much money did you spend on plexiglass and hand sanitizer? So all the various things that you spent money on that you would not have spent money on if it wasn't for the pandemic. And is it just one year? 
you're going to give us that information for fiscal 20 and for fiscal 21. And I've gotten some questions elsewhere about why not fiscal 22. And the issue is that because of when fiscal years end, not all of our organizations have a fiscal 22 that will have been completed. So we wanted to use consistent information from organizations. So fiscal 19 for pre-pandemic, fiscal 20 and fiscal 21. Um, two quick questions that we've gotten a lot of in the Q&A. Is yeah. there a match requirement to this grant? No, there is no matching requirement to this grant. And Sarah, I'm hoping you can answer what is the per date period for which the funds must be used? There's the specific fiscal year in which they must be spent. There is not a restriction on that. Sarah, we have the question. Um, what about fiscal agent based orgs? Mm -hmm. If both the parent and child <laughs> want to apply, can only one apply? No, this is not a problem because what's going to happen is if you have a fiscal agent, you will apply and you will identify yourself in your profile as an organization with a nonprofit objective that has a fiscal agent. And then there will be a section for you to fill out about your fiscal agent, but you are the applicant. That fiscal agent, when they apply, they are the applicant. So this will not be a problem at all. In fact, an organization that act, acts as a fiscal agent for more than one sponsored organization, that's not a problem. The multiple sponsored organizations may all apply as themselves. Okay, Sarah, this is Lillian again with another question. Mm -hmm. Can I apply on behalf of a nonprofit and also for myself for the individual artist grant as an artist? Those you are two separate legal entities. The nonprofit organization is a corporation with a board of directors. It is legally separate from you as an individual. So yes, if you meet the if your nonprofit meets the eligibility, the nonprofit may apply. If you as an individual artist also meet the eligibility, you may apply. You know, if you have full-time employment with your nonprofit, you are not going to meet the eligibility of the individual's program. So, you know. What if, your, yeah, so mm -hmm. uh, what if your FY21 taxes are not done yet? That's similar to the other question about having an audit. Since we're not asking for audits, we are asking for your tax return. If you don't have your draft tax return yet from an accountant, then you should provide internal financial statements that give the same information. So make sure you do give us the same information. And when you upload the fiscal 21 document, include with that a cover note that explains that you do not have your tax return yet. So you are supplying you know, your QuickBooks report, your Excel document, whatever it is, in lieu of having your 990 completed. Okay. 